this is Michael Smith of MedPage Today. I'm in Vienna at the International AIDS Conference, where a trial of a microbicide gel has created an, enor an enormous buzz. At the presentation today, the scientific presentation, there were standing ovations for the researchers, which is, I think, unprecedented, uh, in, at, certainly at this meeting and uh, probably at any scientific meeting that, that I've attended. I'm, with, I'm today speaking with two people who were not involved in the trial, but have been following the issue very closely. Uh, with me uh, are uh, Mitch Warren of the AIDS Vaccine Advocacy Coalition, um, and Ian McGowan of the University of Pittsburgh, who is a co-principal investigator with the Microbicide Trials Network. Gentlemen, welcome to MedPitch. Hi, thanks very much. Let's start with you, Dr. McGowan. This trial, um, found that a microbicide gel actually protects against HIV. This is the first time it's been found. There have been many failed trials or failed products. Um, put this in the context of where we are with microbicides. Well, you know, microbicide science has been evolving for maybe up to 20 years. Um, I think a particular low point was probably 10 years ago in Durban when the results of the Cole 1492 study were presented, where the investigators actually showed that administration of this microbicide candidate resulted potentially in increased risk for women who enrolled in the study. And since that time, we've been looking at a series of other products in large phase three studies. And sadly, you know, up until today, none of them had been able to demonstrate effectiveness in the study populations. Um, this trial was unique because it was the first trial where a gel was administered that contained a potent antiretroviral. Uh, and even more exciting, the investigators were able to demonstrate a significant reduction in the risk of women acquiring HIV who actually used the product. And for that reason alone, it's a landmark study in the field of microbicide research. We'll talk about the details in a minute, but let's, Mitchell, can you put this in the context of prevention in general. You're obviously your coalition mm. by its name has been interested for years in vaccines, but you're also interested in other forms. Where do microbicides fit in that whole picture? Absolutely. Well, you know, we're really looking at a, at a revolution really in prevention science. If we look back over the last 10 months, uh, today marks the second uh, of two proofs of concepts. We had the modest effect with the vaccine at the end of last year in the Thai vaccine trial. And today we have proof of concept with uh, tenofovir gel. I think what's critically important is that these are concepts that people have been chasing for a very long time. Neither of those products are ready for licensing. Neither of them are ready for rollout. But they open up entirely new avenues of scientific investigation and translating those research results into public health impact. At the end of the day, what I think this highlights is uh, while we certainly need a vaccine, while we certainly need a microbicide, it's the opportunity of combination prevention going forward where we can layer each of these interventions on top of one another. So it's a great day for microbicides. It's a great day for prevention science. And I think it's a great day for women and men in, 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 who are at risk of HIV. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about, about the study itself. The, the, the overall effect mm. was a 39% pr protective benefit, uh, reduced, re reduced risk by, by some 39%. Um, that, on the face of it, doesn't sound huge. I mean, you'd want 100%. But put it in context, uh, if you will, either of you, uh, Dr. McCowan mm. perhaps, with, the, with, with other sorts of interventions along these lines. Well, I think, you know, the, the, the bar's been set pretty high by the circumcision studies because the three studies all produced um, an effect size in the region 60%, which was incredible, you know. Um, and I think whenever we look at different modalities of prevention, we have to have that in the back of our minds. And set against that, 39% may seem modest, although it was clinically, it was statistically significant. Um, but when you begin to dissect the data out a little more, there were some intriguing clues there. Um, that endpoint was based on follow-up over 30 months. Uh, but when the investigators looked at the data at 12 months, I believe the figure was, it was in excess of around 50%. So you know, we need to understand why the figure diminished over time, and there were some potential reasons for that. But also when they looked at the data and looked at the women who were most adherent to the gel, they were really using it more than 80% of the time. Um, they actually had an effect size of about 54%. So, you know, um, as someone said earlier today, you know, we haven't hit the ceiling or we haven't hit the wall on effectiveness. I think there's additional things we can do. But at the end of the day, we come back to um, basically the premise that prevention is going to be um, a, a toolbox. There are going to be different modalities. There are going to be combination approaches. We just have to optimize each component as best we can. I see. What's the next step? I mean, obviously this trial is mm -hmm. going to need replication. Uh, science has to be repeated. Uh, and there are a number of trials mm -hmm. in progress. We'll talk about those in a minute. 
But uh, aside from the replication, what what are the regulatory authorities going to need to 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 say yes? Let's go ahead with mm. something like this. You know, that's, that's exactly the right question to ask. I think the, the best answer is uh, to say, what are the next steps? Uh, it's clear that, that there's not one thing that needs to happen next. There are a series of things that need to be happening in parallel and in, with great urgency. Uh, one, we certainly need to understand what the regulatory bodies would say. And in this instance, it's both the Medicines Control Council in South Africa, as well as having a better understanding of what the US FDA and perhaps the European regulatory agency might consider. Uh, the expectation is that, that they would not license a product on a single test of concept trial such as this, but we need to understand what additional information they would require. There is another study of tenofovir gel ongoing, but there are also going to be questions that probably won't be answered by either the Caprisa study or that other study voice, and we need to articulate specifically what is that set of information, and how can we most urgently collect it in different kinds of studies between now and the conclusion of the voice study, and really document a, a, a development plan so that at the completion of that large trial, we would be in a situation to say we now have a package of information that could be submitted potentially for licensure. So we need to work with urgency, I think, in the next couple of months to really put together that framework. Okay. You mentioned the voice trial. Mm -hmm. and that comes, we come back to you, Dr. McGowan. That, that is, of course, the, one of the trials of the Microbicide Trials Network. Yes. Um, yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. What are, what, what are you trying to find out? So the VOICE study is an effectiveness study. It's a safety and effectiveness study. Um, but unlike Caprisa, um, there are a number of um, important differences. The first is we're going to compare multiple types of intervention. So in fact, it's a five-arm study where women will either receive a tablet, be it Truvada or Tenofovir or placebo, or a gel the tenofovir gel we've seen used in the Caprisa study, or matched placebo. Um, it's quite a large study. It's going to be enrolling in the region of 5,000 women in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, I think we have a goal of 16 sites in, in Africa. We have 15 so far activated. And I think we've enro enrolled in the region of 1,000 women. So the study is well underway. Um, and these women are probably going to be followed up for uh, you know one to two years sort of time frame. Um, uh, the study will be designed and powered to demonstrate whether a placebo, uh, well, an active gel is better uh, than a placebo gel, and which of the, whether, you know, Truvada is better than oral placebo, placebo tablet. If the effect sizes are sufficiently dramatic, we may be able to say whether or not, you know, one type of intervention is better than the other. But of course, effectiveness is only one component of the study. We need to know about acceptability. We'll get some useful information whether women prefer a tablet or, or, or a vaginal product. And also differential safety. You know, when you give a topical product, you probably minimize systemic toxicity. And certainly the Caprisa data were very um, um, benign in terms of safety profile. But when you give antiretroviral drugs, and in the case of Truvada, two drugs, orally, you basically have the issues around systemic safety. Um, so it's going to be a very interesting study. We hope we'll have finished the study currently, trajectory, probably by the second or third quarter of 2012. So just a chance we'll hear, we'll hear from that at the next International AIDS Conference in Washington. I hope so, yeah. Well, on that note, gentlemen, it's, uh, it's certainly been, as some people said uh, today, a, a very interesting day. Some people use the words historic. Um, but certainly a, a major step forward. Thank you both today. Thank you. In Vienna, I'm Michael Smith, MedPage Today. <laughs>